The purpose of this presentation is to highlight the importance of a mechanism of nutrient adaptation called the glucose fatty acid cycle and examine its relationship to insulin resistance. By revealing the significance of the glucose fatty acid cycle, this presentation is also meant to dispel myths about the role of carbohydrates in the human diet and to raise serious questions about the existing dogma that blames carbohydrates for the current epidemics of obesity and type 2 diabetes. While the presentation assumes a certain working knowledge of basic human metabolism, those who are not experts will find it simple enough to glean valuable information. Muscles burn a combination of glucose and fat for energy. What fuel they burn is dependent upon what is available and the energy demand. During low-level activities, muscles rely upon fat for fuel. When the demand for energy increases, as during aerobic activity or anaerobic activity like sprinting, muscles shift to breaking down carbohydrates for fuel. In 1963, Philip Randall and colleagues showed that there was a competition between glucose and fatty acids in isolated rat cardiac muscle. This competition in fuel selection was called the glucose fatty acid cycle or Randall cycle because the use of one fuel source suppresses the use of the other. Glucose utilization suppresses fatty acid oxidation and promotes glucose and fat storage, while fatty acid utilization suppresses glucose oxidation and the storage of glycogen. This diagram is intended to give an overview of how the competition works. So when fatty acids predominate as a source of fuel, there is an increase in the breakdown of fat, called beta oxidation, and a suppression of glucose uptake that occurs mainly through the inhibition of insulin receptor signaling that normally allows for the translocation of glucose transporter, GLUT4, to the membrane of the cell where it can facilitate the uptake of glucose. Glucose oxidation is suppressed mainly due to the decrease in glucose uptake and thus availability inside the cell. This is the use of the other. Glucose utilization suppresses fatty acid oxidation and promotes glucose and fat storage, while fatty acid utilization suppresses glucose oxidation and the storage of glycogen. The glucose fatty acid cycle is significant because it represents another level of metabolic control besides the more widely known hormonal controls that regulate the breakdown and storage of glucose and fat. The glucose fatty acid cycle provides another mechanism by which the body can adapt to nutrient availability. This is particularly important during starvation where fat serves as a dominant fuel source and glucose must be preserved to fuel the brain. This slide serves as a reminder of how hormonal regulation of blood sugar works. It is the typical figure shown in basic biochemistry textbooks showing that when blood glucose is low, during the time in between meals, or the result of an overnight fast, the pancreas releases the hormone glucagon, which stimulates glucose synthesis or gluconeogenesis in the liver. Conversely, when blood glucose is high, as in after a meal, then the pancreas releases the hormone insulin, which acts on muscle cells to stimulate the uptake of glucose to use as fuel and to make glycogen. The glucose fatty acid cycle is a hormone-independent way of regulating the use of fat and glucose that isn't discussed much or at all in biochemistry textbooks, but appears in the scientific literature. There are many explanations as to why this type of hormone-independent nutrient regulation would be beneficial. For one, during a fasted state, the cycle is glucose sparing, that is to say that glucose oxidation is suppressed in favor of fatty acid oxidation, which prevents muscles from breaking down glucose so that it can be diverted to the brain which cannot use fat for fuel. The body must spend energy to make glucose in the liver and it would be a tremendous waste of energy to break down this glucose to use as fuel for muscle tissue which can rely on fat and ketone bodies. So the glucose fatty acid cycle allows for a tightly controlled and more efficient use of glucose during starvation, fasting, or endurance exercise. To understand the importance of the glucose fatty acid cycle and its relevance to basic metabolism and insulin resistance, it is important to understand what happens to metabolism during a prolonged fast when the body enters a state known as ketosis. The body has three types of fuel reserves, glycogen, fat, and muscle. 
although it is not ideal to break down muscle tissue for energy, as the loss of muscle mass compromises one's health. But nevertheless, it can be used in an emergency. The amount of energy that is stored in the form of glycogen is small compared to fat. Liver glycogen is depleted during an overnight fast, and the body must then rely upon fat and what are termed ketone bodies, which are derived from the breakdown of fatty acids. The ketone bodies can be broken down to release energy via the citric acid cycle. The liver must then make glucose from certain amino acids and, to a lesser extent, from the glycerol backbone of triglycerides. After a prolonged fast, intermediates of the citric acid cycle, which are also used to make glucose, become depleted, and acetyl-CoA accumulates, accelerating the formation of ketone bodies, which can ultimately lead to a dangerous condition called ketoacidosis. This diagram sums up what happens in the fasted state. Insulin secretion decreases, fat cells release fatty acids for use as fuel by the body's tissues, and the liver converts byproducts of fatty acid breakdown into ketone bodies, which enter the bloodstream so they can be taken up and used as fuel. After days of fasting, the ketone levels elevate which can lead to what is called ketoacidosis, in which the pH of the blood decreases, a dangerous and potentially fatal condition. A decrease in blood pH affects the ability of hemoglobin to bind oxygen. Ketoacidosis can occur in a variety of conditions, including people with unmanaged type 1 diabetes, chronic alcoholics, and low-carb dieters. In fact, some low-carb gurus advise dieters to buy urine strips that detect the presence of ketone bodies to ensure that dieters are indeed maintaining a level of carbohydrates that is low enough to induce ketosis. Low-carb advocates maintain that ketones are a superior fuel, and that since ketosis is a natural state, that there is nothing dangerous about maintaining such a diet. However, scientific evidence runs contrary to this idea, and responsible health professionals warn patients of the dangers of such a diet. Low-carb proponents like Gary Taubes actually assert that the classic signs of ketosis, bad breath due to the exhalation of acetone generated by the production of ketone bodies, muscle weakness, shakiness, mental fogginess, are really signs of carbohydrate withdrawal and that carbohydrates are addictive, much like cocaine. Essentially, the low-carb movement teaches a distorted view of human metabolism. There is no question as to whether or not caloric or carbohydrate deficiency causes depletion of glycogen stores, which leads to ketosis, which then leads to the symptoms of ketosis, or using a fuel source that isn't optimal, essentially starving your muscles and brain of carbohydrates and forcing your body to work very hard to make glucose from protein. This is so basic in the world of biochemistry that it is really shocking that it has been so easily distorted by people claiming to be purveyors of good science. In the upside-down version of metabolism pushed in the low-carb world, carbohydrate withdrawal is the cause of the symptoms of ketosis, and ketosis is the cure, and something you can apparently stay on indefinitely. Essentially, this kind of reasoning goes something like ketosis somehow cures ketosis or carbohydrate deficiency cures carbohydrate deficiency, which makes no sense. Furthermore, there is no mention of the importance of glycogen in this line of reasoning. Glycogen as an important energy store is completely ignored. This upside-down view of metabolism should be of grave concern to the scientific community who must counter this kind of miseducation of the public in which the symptoms of carbohydrate deficiency are used as so-called evidence of their addictive properties instead of the effects of a diet that is deficient in an essential macronutrient and a desperate attempt by the body to make the carbohydrates that the dieter is denying it. As mentioned earlier, the glucose fatty acid cycle is glucose sparing, which is important during times of fasting or starvation. During such times, the body's primary source of fuel is fat. Glucose becomes precious. The liver must make glucose by tearing down muscle tissue and using the amino acids as gluconeogenic precursors. By suppressing glucose oxidation in muscle tissue and giving preference to the breakdown of fat, the glucose is preserved for use by the brain. 
since unlike muscle, the brain cannot break down fat for energy. Now we can begin to discuss the glucose fatty acid cycle with regards to insulin resistance by examining the similarities between starvation and type 2 diabetes. During starvation, the body's primary source of fuel is fat. A high fat diet, or what is called the Western diet, also means that fat serves as a dominant source of fuel. This means that fatty acid oxidation prevails and glucose oxidation is suppressed. The inability to take up glucose from the blood, or insulin resistance, is a part of the sparing effect of the glucose fatty acid cycle. The seemingly paradoxical effect of gluconeogenesis in type 2 diabetics, in which the liver is making glucose yet blood glucose is high, is also explained by this glucose sparing effect. Essentially, a high fat diet mimics starvation. While caloric needs are met, the prevalence of fat prevents muscles from using glucose. The glucose fatty acid cycle itself can be thought of as not so much a competition between fuel sources, but a physiological difference between being in a metabolic state of emergency in which anabolic pathways are inhibited and the effects of insulin are blunted in an effort to conserve glucose and a non-emergency state in which adequate amounts of glucose are present and the body can enter an anabolic phase to begin to store energy and synthesize proteins and other molecules. By starving the cells for glucose, type 2 diabetics are prevented from entering a normal anabolic state and remain in a state of constant emergency. The figures on this slide were taken from a paper published in the Journal of Clinical Investigation and show the results of an experiment that tested the effect of plasma-free fatty acids, or FFAs, on glucose uptake. In healthy volunteers, researchers injected triglyceride emulsions at three different concentrations, a low, medium, or high range, and measured whole body glucose uptake over the course of six hours. The top graph monitors the plasma concentrations of FFAs over time, while the bottom graph monitors glucose uptake over time. The closed circles represent a low concentration of FFAs, the open circles represent a medium concentration, while the open triangles represent a high concentration of FFAs. As you can see from the bottom graph, glucose uptake is clearly inhibited by high levels of plasma FFAs, represented again by the open triangles, and that this inhibition becomes statistically significant at three and a half hours after the infusion of fat. Using the same protocol described in the previous slide, researchers measured the effect of plasma-free fatty acids on the ability to synthesize glycogen. Again, the top graph monitors the concentration of free fatty acids over time, while the bottom graph monitors glycogen synthesis over time. The bottom graph clearly shows the inhibition of glycogen synthesis plotted on the x-axis in the presence of high levels of plasma FFAs, again represented by the open triangles. Taken together, these two experiments indicate that high levels of FFAs hinder normal glucose metabolism. This data is reproducible and hardly controversial, yet is completely ignored by low-carb advocates. Type 2 diabetes and obesity are characterized by a phenomenon called metabolic inflexibility, or an inability to adapt metabolism from a fasted to fed state. This means that their ability to switch from the use of fat to the use of carbohydrates for fuel is impaired. Other aspects of metabolic inflexibility include an inability to adjust fat oxidation to fat availability, leading to an accumulation of fat inside non-adipose tissues, a term called lipotoxicity, which itself is a condition that leads to cellular dysfunction and apoptosis or cell death. Metabolic inflexibility is found in the diabetic maladapted heart and is one potential explanation for the association between type 2 diabetes and heart failure. This graph, taken from the journal Obesity Reviews, illustrates the concept of metabolic inflexibility. A healthy individual, represented by the solid line, is able to adjust their metabolism and switch from fat oxidation to carbohydrate oxidation, a switch that normally occurs after the ingestion of a meal.
a metabolically inflexible person, represented by the dotted line, is impaired in the ability to increase either carbohydrate oxidation or lipid oxidation according to fuel availability. With insulin's essential role in mediating glucose uptake and the detrimental effects that occur as a result of a defect in this process, how is it that insulin became the fattening hormone? In this presentation, we've already seen how high levels of plasma-free fatty acids inhibit glucose uptake, and experiments also reveal that fatty acid metabolites hinder insulin receptor signaling, thus creating insulin resistance. Nowhere mentioned in the insulin makes you fat hypothesis is the point that it is insulin that allows muscle cells to take up glucose to make glycogen. This is one of insulin's prime directives. It should be noted that type 2 diabetics cannot store glycogen effectively. Yet insulin is labeled as the fattening hormone, and anything that causes its levels to rise is a fattening food. Never mind the fact that without it, you would essentially starve to death, as is the case with type 1 or insulin-dependent diabetes. Insulin is not so much the fattening hormone, but the life-saving hormone, as in you cannot live without it. It isn't enough that you can break down the food that you ingest. You have to have a way of getting that, those nutrients into the cells of your body, otherwise they starve. Many popular diet books raged against the hormone insulin, with a zone diet's creator, Dr. Barry Sears, asserting that it was insulin that made you fat, not fat. Subsequently, insulin's role as an anabolic hormone, or a hormone that stimulates the synthesis of molecules rather than their breakdown, became distorted. Insulinogenic foods, or foods that stimulate the release of insulin, became known as fattening foods, with potatoes leading the pack. Carbohydrates quickly became suspect despite the fact that it is carbohydrate uptake and catabolism that is hindered due to the high levels of FFAs in the plasma of obese persons. If we are to have any kind of serious scientific discussion about insulin, it is important to examine insulin's overall role in metabolism as it has a variety of critical functions. Insulin stimulates cells to take up glucose from the blood enabling muscle cells to make glycogen. Insulin also stimulates the uptake of amino acids, inhibits proteolysis, and stimulates protein synthesis. It also inhibits lipolysis and stimulates the biosynthesis of fatty acids for storage in the form of triglycerides. However, most of the fatty acid substrate for triglyceride synthesis comes in the form of fat circulating FFAs, not glucose. By distorting the function of insulin and highlighting its fat-storing properties while ignoring its many other functions, insulin has become something of a dirty word. This figure from the journal Nature gives an overview of the many functions of insulin. Insulin binding to the insulin receptor provides a critical signal that keeps cells alive by allowing them to take up fuel and then utilize that fuel to do work, as in muscle contraction, or to synthesize other cellular proteins. By ignoring one of the main goals of insulin, to enable the muscle cells to make glycogen, and overemphasizing the ability to make fat from excess glucose, which occurs after the available glucose has been converted to glycogen, the idea that insulin is a fattening hormone has taken hold in the public's mind, and in the minds of many scientists who ignore any research about glycogen. That glycogen could even possibly be linked to satiety is not even proposed by scientists. This is an area of research that is underrepresented as attention is focused on appetite hormones and possible genetic causes. Another myth about insulin is its effect on the enzyme lipoprotein lipase. Low-carb advocates maintain that since insulin stimulates lipoprotein lipase, or LPL, in adipocytes, or fat cells, it must be a fattening enzyme. LPL allows fat cells to take up fat from chylomicrons delivered from the fat you ingest. Insulin's activation of LPL is a part of insulin's overall role, and that is to get nutrients ingested from a meal into cells where it can be broken down for energy. After you eat, the fat from your meal gets packaged into chylomicrons that enter the circulation through the lymphatic system so that the fatty acids can be delivered to tissues and taken up and used for energy or stored for later use.
Fat can't stay in the blood if it's to be used for energy. There has to be a way of getting it into cells, and that's the function of LPL. People with deficiencies in LPL, or a cofactor for LPL, actually have visibly creamy-looking blood from the inability to remove fat. They also have fatty deposits beneath the skin and must maintain a very low-fat diet. So blaming an enzyme that simply acts to remove fat from the blood and deliver it to tissues makes no sense. The best way to prevent LPL from delivering fat to adipocytes is to ultimately eat less fat. A more complete scientific picture of insulin reveals insulin to be a strengthening hormone, a hormone that makes athletic endurance even possible. Insulin plays an essential role in storing glycogen, and as mentioned earlier, the inability to effectively store glycogen is a hallmark of type 2 diabetes. No athlete would dare to adopt a diet that was deficient in insulinogenic foods because that would translate into having no endurance. Glycogen is completely left out of the picture of carbohydrate metabolism in the low-carb world, and often even in the scientific community that has turned its attention to restricting dietary carbohydrates. Because fatty acids cannot be turned into sugar, a low-carb, high-fat diet is very inefficient in that it forces the liver to make glucose from amino acids and the glycerol backbone of triglycerides, which is energetically costly. This means that on a low-carb diet, it is impossible to effectively store glycogen. A low-carb diet celebrates nothing but inefficiency. If we are to have any kind of serious scientific discussion about insulin, it is important to examine insulin's overall role in metabolism as it has a variety of critical functions. Insulin stimulates cells to take up glucose from the blood, enabling muscle cells to make glycogen. Insulin also stimulates the uptake of amino acids, inhibits proteolysis, and stimulates protein synthesis. It also inhibits lipolysis and stimulates the biosynthesis of fatty acids for storage in the form of triglycerides. However, most of the fatty acid substrate for triglyceride synthesis comes in the form of fat circulating FFAs, not glucose. By distorting the function of insulin and highlighting its fat storing properties while ignoring its many other functions, insulin has become something of a dirty word. This figure illustrates the relationship between carbohydrates and endurance. It is taken from a sports physiology text, which is usually the only place where you see any attention being paid to glycogen, and it clearly shows the effects of a low-carb diet on endurance. As a low-carb dieter begins to exercise, they have a reduced ability to utilize carbohydrates and rely more heavily upon fat, while their glycogen stores are quickly depleted whereas a person on a high-carbohydrate diet has over two times the endurance and an increased ability to utilize carbohydrates as energy because their glycogen stores are full. This is why you'll never see a low-carb endurance athlete. It's called losing or never even making it to the finish line. This is why the author of The Paleo Diet, Dr. Lauren Cordain, had to come out with a version for athletes that allowed for the consumption of carbohydrates because a paleo diet is disastrous for athletic performance. However, it should be pointed out that athletes do not have some alien metabolism. It is not just skeletal muscle that is affected by the inability to store glycogen or to utilize glucose for energy. It's also smooth muscle as well. It's the muscle of your digestive tract, blood vessel walls, and respiratory tract. These muscles are likewise compromised. Studies have revealed that obese persons and those with type 2 diabetes have high circulating free fatty acids, and as shown in previous slides, when circulating free fatty acids are high, insulin's actions are blunted and the uptake of glucose by muscle tissue is reduced. The accumulation of free fatty acids in skeletal muscle induces the gene expression of gluconeogenic enzymes because ultimately the skeletal muscle can't get adequate glucose and must resort to making it. This goes back to the metabolic similarity between type 2 diabetes and starvation. The presence of fat and the absence of glucose is a signal to the muscle tissue that glucose, an important energy source, is scarce. Delivery of free fatty acids to the liver also induces gluconeogenesis, meaning that the liver works to make glucose despite the high blood glucose levels that characterize type 2 diabetes.
In this case, the liver acts in a similar manner to muscle tissue, where the high levels of fat serve as a signal that the body is in a state of starvation. The data showing the relationship between a high-fat diet and insulin resistance is extensive. In fact, the standard protocol for inducing insulin resistance in mouse models used to study obesity and type 2 diabetes is to feed them a high-fat, otherwise known as a Western diet. This diet has been shown to hinder normal insulin signaling and to inhibit the uptake of glucose from the blood. A high-fat diet has also been associated with chronic low levels of inflammation. Obese persons have high levels of TNF-alpha, or tumor necrosis factor alpha, which is an inflammatory cytokine involved in mounting an immune response to a variety of pathogens. TNF-alpha also acts to hinder insulin signaling, further contributing to insulin resistance. Since the 1990s, scientists have shown that pro-inflammatory cytokines are overexpressed in obese individuals. TNF-alpha levels are also elevated in numerous animal models of obesity. Infusion of TNF-alpha in rats induces insulin resistance, while the neutralization of TNF-alpha in Zucker rats improves insulin resistance. In addition to their ability to inhibit insulin signaling, inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha have a host of other negative consequences, including endothelial cell dysfunction, which has been shown to be useful in predicting certain vascular events, such as heart attack and ischemic stroke. The data linking a high-fat diet to insulin resistance is considerable and difficult to ignore, which begs the question, why is everyone so afraid of carbohydrates? Protein cannot serve as a primary source of fuel due to its nitrogen content. Human beings are not carnivores, and it is important to remind people that deriving more than 40% of your calories from protein is dangerous and can even be fatal. Because protein cannot serve as a primary source of calories, low-carb diets and ketogenic diets are necessarily high-fat diets. Yet despite the overwhelming evidence that implicates a high-fat diet as the driver of insulin resistance, carbohydrates have become the enemy in today's dietary guidelines. On this slide, we have the Harvard Food Pyramid, put forth by the Harvard School of Public Health, and it really illustrates today's schizophrenia when it comes to the dogma concerning the role of carbohydrates in the diet. Today's guidelines extol the virtues of whole grains without really defining why whole grains are important, other than a vague notion about fiber contributing to satiety. But the claim that fiber is satiating is a hypothesis anyone can test at home by eating a head of cabbage for dinner. Such a meal is full of fiber but hardly satiating. In fact, this idea of fiber filling up the stomach and providing satiety was used to create a diet product several years ago that consisted of a type of fiber that swelled up in the stomach and small intestines so much that it created bowel obstructions in people and was pulled from the market. At the top of this pyramid are potatoes, pasta, and white rice, otherwise known as the world's staple foods, which are likened to candy and soda pop. Never mind that these foods have long sustained civilizations before the very recent epidemic of obesity. Their whole grain counterparts, whole wheat bread and whole wheat pasta, appear at the bottom of the pyramid, along with oil, making it appear, according to the pyramid, as though fat should be the foundation of a healthy diet. What this pyramid does so well is to create a totally mixed message surrounding carbohydrates. It says that as long as there is fiber present in the carbohydrate, that it is made from whole grain, it is a healthy staple food as if it is the fiber that provides satiety, instead of the starch itself. Starch, being the energy store of plants, resembles glycogen, the energy store of muscles. Instead of conveying the message that starches provide satiety, in particular boiled ones, in which the cooking method has not destroyed the long chains of glucose polymers, which allow muscles to effectively store glycogen, the pyramid conveys the message that fiber provides satiety, and good carbohydrates are good because of the part of the plant you can't actually digest. If this were true, then adding fiber to cake and cookies would then turn these into acceptable staple foods. In fact, adding fiber to foods is a common strategy now in food processing, largely because, because of this idea that fiber equals satiety.
Another problem with the pyramid is that it absolutely abolishes the notion of simple and complex carbohydrates. The pyramid says that all carbohydrates are effectively a form of glucose, and it makes no difference whether they are in long or short chains. It says that crackers and breads, baked carbohydrates, are the same types of carbohydrates as pasta and rice, which are boiled carbohydrates. The distinction is significant in both chemistry and in biology, and everyone is aware of this distinction, as they would hardly find a bowl full of crackers and spaghetti sauce as satisfying or filling as a bowl of pasta and spaghetti sauce. There is a reason why bread accompanies a meal, but is not the meal in traditional cuisine. The destruction of this distinction between boiled and baked carbohydrates is the unfortunate legacy of the glycemic index, a measurement that fails to predict the nutritional value of foods and yet is used to vilify foods like white rice. To give an example of the inanity of the glycemic index, french fries have a lower glycemic index than pasta, potato chips have a lower glycemic index than many fruits. Instead of rejecting this measurement that fails to provide any practical guide to foods, scientists have continued to hang on to the concept of glycemic index and fast and slow carbs without any evidence that such a measurement is useful. Because the evidence linking a high-fat diet to obesity and type 2 diabetes is being ignored as the public and the media continue to condemn carbs, it is important to ask how carbohydrates became the enemy in the fight against obesity. This switch from warning the public about the dangers of a high-fat diet to railing against carbohydrates occurred for several reasons. Many scientists operate under the assumption that America has already tried the low-fat experiment and that it was a resounding failure. This is an assumption that isn't true according to many resources, including the USDA food disappearance data that we will examine in a moment. There has also been a backlash against the message advising people to cut back on the amount of fat in their diet. Contrary to what the diet industry says or the public's perception, the USDA has never recommended a fat-free diet, but rather a diet of around 30% fat, which is hardly extreme or punishing. The Atkins diet and other low-carb diets appeal to people by offering the idea that you can eat all the fat you want because fat can't possibly make you fat. Only carbohydrates make you fat. Their appeal is to those who have tried to maintain an unnecessarily strict low-fat diet and have failed, or those who believe that a healthy diet is composed of unsatisfying salads and tasteless tofu, when in reality a healthy diet is varied can include meat and enough fat to keep food flavorful and satisfying. Finally, because of glycemic index, many scientists view all carbs as nothing more than sugar, and since blood glucose levels are high in type 2 diabetes, sugar must be the culprit. The data concerning fat and its role in preventing glucose uptake and insulin receptor signaling seems to have been completely disregarded. By using the term whole grain to classify carbohydrates as either good or bad, scientists have avoided clarifying the role of carbohydrates in the diet. Are carbohydrates only valuable for the fiber that is indigestible? Are the only good carbs the ones you can't actually digest? Why can't starch, a molecule that structurally resembles glycogen, be considered valuable? Starch is the form of energy store for plants, just as glycogen is the energy store of muscle. To ignore this similarity in structure and function is a gross oversight. Structure determining function is a common theme throughout biology, and nutrition is no exception. Polyunsaturated fats have a different structure than saturated fats, and thus have different properties and biological roles. Why wouldn't the structure of carbohydrates likewise be important? To follow the whole grain logic, that would make whole grain toaster pastries, waffles, pizza crusts, boxed breakfast cereal, and donuts the foundation of a healthy diet. Why should these foods be considered more nutritious than the so-called deadly whites, like rice, potatoes, and pasta, that have served as the foundation of the human diet for centuries, long before the current obesity epidemic? This slide underscores the silliness of the term whole grain, which in many instances is nothing more than an advertising gimmick. 
You can find whole grain versions of many of America's favorite junk food items because ultimately the term implies that the mere addition of fiber can turn a dessert into a staple food. By this logic, adding fiber to soda would make it a healthy low glycemic drink. There's probably a product similar to this in development now as putting the term whole grain on any product boosts sales. The fact that it's still junk food is irrelevant. The quote on this slide was published in a letter to the medical journal The Lancet in 2004 and also highlights the funding problems nutritional research faces. Regrettably, funding for nutrition research is not unlimited, even in obesity and diabetes. Effective dietary change reduces the need for intervention with drugs and therefore gives no benefit to the pharmaceutical industry. And lower consumption of processed food does not benefit much of the food industry. Yet there is much potential gain for global health if we find the right nutritional way to address the risks of diabetes and obesity. Again, the overall message is that nutritional research is not a profitable endeavor when compared to developing drugs to combat obesity and diabetes. There is nothing to patent. Yet despite the decades of research and large sums of money poured into obesity research, it is the drug target approach that has failed to tackle these two enormous problems not a nutritional approach. The drug approach has failed to make even a dent in the obesity problem in America. It is projected that by 2050, one in three Americans could have type 2 diabetes. Considering that obesity and type 2 diabetes are two completely preventable diseases, the current paths of research have been utterly disastrous, as there was never any real attempt to actually solve either of these problems. The thing about obesity research is that it isn't necessarily tied to nutritional research. In fact, nutritional research lags behind research in other disciplines for a variety of reasons, with the most important one being that there is very little money invested in exploring a nutritional approach to this problem, as changing the American diet is not of benefit to food manufacturers or pharmaceutical companies. There is instead an emphasis on genetics, epigenetics, endocrinology, immunological explanations, and even evolutionary causes instead of the underlying nutritional causes. Scientists even push the idea that dietary approaches don't work in favor of dealing with the problem through the development of drugs, which would be an approach more lucrative for pharmaceutical companies. The following quote taken from an article published in the journal Nature Reviews Immunology examining the relationship between inflammation and obesity in particular illustrates this kind of logic popular in academia. As behavioral and dietary approaches have been ineffective in combating obesity, a greater emphasis is being placed on understanding the molecular links between obesity and chronic metabolic diseases. This quote actually asserts that dietary approaches have been ineffective. However, there is no evidence to suggest that the American population has ever undertaken any major dietary changes, such as adopting a diet that is significantly lower in fat or calories. While many Americans may in fact diet, the overall fat content in the American diet has not decreased to anywhere near what the USDA recommends, which is a diet of around 30% fat and the overall caloric consumption of the average American has significantly increased since the 1970s. The investigation into molecular links is research that is done in the hopes of developing drug targets and eventually drugs aimed at treating obesity that would bring enormous profits to pharmaceutical companies and to the academic scientists who collaborate with them. Many who blame obesity on carbohydrates maintain that sugar is addictive. Chief among them is Dr. Robert Lustig, who claims that sugar is toxic and proposes that it be treated like a controlled substance. He states that it is a drug because it acts on the reward centers of the brain, much like cocaine, increasing dopamine levels. However, lots of things increase dopamine levels, like exercise and listening to your favorite music. This line of reasoning would essentially make all reward-seeking behavior an addiction. Likening sugar to cocaine is nothing more than an attention-grabbing type of finger-pointing done in scientific language that demonizes yet another pathway, the dopamine pathway. Of course, the sugar is addictive mantra places people in a very difficult predicament in which food becomes an addictive substance.
If food is addictive, how does one recover from such an addiction? And why isn't fat considered to be addictive? By pushing the idea that sugar is addictive, it makes it seem as though your biology is working against you. And you'll never be off sugar because glucose is an important fuel source. That's simply a fact of our biology. If you don't eat the sugar glucose, your body will make it. Pushing the idea of addiction also keeps carbohydrates suspect. And how does the addiction idea even hold when insulin resistance actually makes it difficult for your body to even use sugar as fuel? If sugar is addictive, then why does the brain rely upon glucose for fuel? Then, of course, there is the problem of what exactly do you mean by sugar? Glucose? Fructose? Galactose? Human beings eat a variety of sugars and always have. Fructose is the sugar that makes fruit sweet. Is fruit now toxic? The argument is a sloppy one. Many things ingested over a certain amount are toxic. Vitamin A at a certain level will kill you, as will a diet high in protein. To use the word toxic in reference to sugar and likening sugar to arsenic or Agent Orange is scientifically absurd and merely clouds the issues surrounding carbohydrates. Is it good to avoid eating a diet full of sugar? Of course, because a diet full of sugar is also high in fat and deficient in starch and other nutrients. But this idea is not remotely new or revolutionary, and it is an argument that nutritionists have always made. This is a graph showing the total amount of daily calories eaten by Americans from 1970 to 2010. The data was taken from the USDA food availability records, which are corrected for loss due to spoilage. As you can see, total food consumption in America has increased 458 calories per day since 1970, with the peak increase in consumption occurring in 2000, with an increase of 525 calories per day. This graph, also taken from the same USDA database, shows a breakdown of added daily calories from sugar, flour and cereal products, dairy fats, and fats and oils since 1970. As you can see, there has been quite an increase in the amount of added fats and oils, as well as flour and cereal products, while only a modest increase in added sugar. And it is also important to point out that our added sugar consumption has been decreasing over the last decade, while the obesity rate has continued to climb. This represents a serious flaw in the argument for making sugar the driver of obesity and its many physiological consequences. Dairy fats have also been on the rise rather steadily since 1970. And it should be pointed out that the spike in added fats and oils that occurred around the year 2000 coincided with the release of articles like What If It's All a Big Fat Lie, which maintained that carbohydrates were to blame for the nation's obesity epidemic, not fats. During the same time period, there was also a jump in obesity rates, as illustrated in the next two slides. The figure on this slide was taken straight from the CDC's website, and it maps out the percentage of obese individuals in each state in the year 2000. Note that at this time, the majority of states have an obesity rate under 20%. This slide shows obesity rates in each state in 2010. As you can see in one decade, the same decade in which there was a spike in the amount of added fats and oils consumed daily, the number of states with over 30% of the population classified as obese has exploded and is mainly concentrated in the South. This evidence should dispel any notions about fats' inability to make people fat. Because potatoes have become the single most malign carbohydrate, it's essential to examine just how potatoes are eaten today versus decades ago before the obesity epidemic. This graph paints a shocking picture of how the manner in which potatoes are consumed has changed. There has been an increase in frozen potato consumption, which appears in the diet in the form of french fries, hash browns, tater tots, almost exclusively in the deep fried form, while consumption of fresh potatoes has decreased. America's overall potato consumption has actually declined in the last decade, 
due to the vicious campaign against the food waged by Harvard's Dr. Walter Willett, who singles out the potato as a major contributor to obesity and type 2 diabetes, based on the consumption of French fries as a part of a high-fat diet and other deep-fried forms of the vegetable completely ignoring the lack of obesity and type 2 diabetes among cultures who consume large quantities of boiled potatoes. After all, potatoes are not a new food, and have been a staple food of civilizations for centuries, long before the obesity epidemic. Despite the decrease in overall potato consumption, the rate of obesity in America continues to grow. The point of this presentation is to present evidence that reveals that the case against carbohydrates to be built on a foundation of quicksand, a line of reasoning that does not fit with experimental data or the history of the human diet for that matter. This presentation also highlights the importance of the glucose fatty acid cycle and its ability to provide a plausible mechanism by which a high fat diet drives insulin resistance. Scientists have proven that high levels of free fatty acids suppress glucose uptake, suppress insulin receptor signaling, and reduces the ability of muscle to take up glucose and make glycogen. Research has also laid bare the harmful effects of a high-fat diet by showing that it is not only linked to insulin resistance, but also to the presence of chronic low levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines, which have a host of negative consequences. And yet, in spite of all this research, Americans continue to eat a diet rich in fat and more meat than ever before, while obesity rates continue to climb. How can it make sense to blame carbohydrates and suggest eating a diet that is even higher in fat? The low-carb movement represents a huge stumbling block to combating an extremely damaging and costly epidemic. Blaming carbohydrates for obesity and type 2 diabetes without recognizing their essential role in physiology without recognizing the fact that carbohydrates have always served as the foundation of the human diet since the development of agriculture, and without recognizing the fact that a diet with anything other than carbohydrates as the foundation is unsustainable is a futile argument that blocks attempts at meaningful change. In reality, a low-carb diet in modern society is only relevant to a minority of wealthy individuals. Eating high on the food chain translates into using more and more land to grow crops to feed animals instead of people, which means that the world's poor will be left without access to affordable food. Eating high on the food chain is also dangerous for the planet. Forests are destroyed to make room for growing animal feed and to make room for cattle to graze. And of course it comes as no surprise to anyone who has studied biology that the concentration of toxins increases as one travels up the food chain which means that a diet rich in meat makes one more susceptible to consuming potentially toxic amounts of any environmental contaminants present in the ecosystem. In short, there is no solution to the obesity and type 2 diabetes epidemics that doesn't involve carbohydrates. Instead of petty finger pointing and designing experiments involving arbitrary and nonsensical categories in an effort to sustain ideas that are flawed to begin with, scientists should turn their attention to understanding carbohydrates instead of condemning them.